movies. Oh yeah, party people. Bobo here with Brass Real Brothers. Thanks for coming back for another episode of Brass Real tonight. Sorry I had to do it a little hour late today. Um, my buddy Rylan, who's supposed to join who's supposed to join me on Mondays, he wasn't able to make it today, had a little bit of an emergency rise. So I had to kind of switch gears for a second, reshuffle some things. We were going to discuss some stuff in depth on some other movies, but we're not going to do that now. Switching gears, just rolling with the punches. So thank you guys for joining me to all the six fans out there. And um, hey, Esmaniac, what up, buddy? Looking good. Thanks for joining me. That's a buddy of mine there. Cool dude. But anyways, had a kind of crazy weekend. Not a whole lot happened. I went and saw Jungle Cruise. You guys, um, if you hadn't seen that yet, feel free to check out my review if you're curious about it. I did a review on that, put that out on Saturday. You know, I was pleasantly surprised. I thought it was actually pretty good. I didn't think it was going to be all that great starting off because, let's face it, Disney, when they're putting out movies like that, a lot of the time, especially with the Pirates of the Caribbean track record now, the way they just got progressively worse and worse and worse, if you ask me. This movie was just kind of not exciting me in the trailers. But once I started seeing more and more about it, I was kind of secretly telling myself, why do I want to see this movie? I, I think I need to go see it. And honestly, I had a lot of fun with it. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, it turned out to be exactly what you saw in the trailers. It wasn't anything more, wasn't anything less. They didn't try to complicate it too much. They didn't try to make it deeper than it needed to be for what the movie is. It's a Jungle Cruise movie. And it was based off of a ride. And it kind of felt like that. And like I said, I'm not going to get in too deep on it. If, if you guys want to check it out, like I said, my reviews on my channel as well. You know, it's about six minutes long. Won't take you a whole lot of time. It'll give you a good idea to what to expect and if you want to go see or not. But with that being said about Jungle Cruise, recently we just got the information about the numbers it pulled in. And it pulled in $32 million this weekend, which is pretty good. That's, you know, and that's with the Delta variant being a sort of a prominent thing right now, keeping people at their homes and everything like that. So it actually, it hit that 32 million debut and they were hoping it would do more because it's Jungle Cruise. It's a Disney movie. It's The Rock. It's all that stuff. Emily Blunt, which she was great in it. He was pretty good in it. There were some moments where he was kind of, eh. but I think this is just another sign of Disney messing up. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. And that's going to be kind of the main point of the conversation today in a little bit. But I do feel like they're hurting themselves with sales and nobody's going to see these movies like they normally would. I went to the theater and I went at nighttime. It just wasn't that packed. Black Widow wasn't that packed. Oddly enough, the one that was packed more than anything, which I guess it's not oddly enough, but to me, F9 was shoulder to shoulder. When I went to go see that, everybody was neck and neck in that movie. Black Widow, it just wasn't like that. This one definitely wasn't like that. I'm not sure if Disney's going to keep this Premier Plus thing up where they release the movies in theater and on Disney at the same time. We'll see. But like I said, that's in a little bit of a conversation that I'm going to get to that's the main part of this story. But overall, I wasn't expecting the, the movie to do that good and i wasn't expecting the movie to be that good so check it out if you're interested this is something that i think as maniac you're gonna like this too you're definitely gonna uh, as maniac says it looks all right you really changed my mind on it and i have things about it, the rock in the movie i don't like yeah uh so it's definitely that exactly what you just said things about the rock in it kind of take away from it in certain parts and it's just like you're trying too hard buddy you all right, it's kind of like you ever see that moment where a kid tells a joke at a party and then he's like a younger kid, he's, but there's like a bunch of adults around. And let's say the joke just sails. He nails the joke, punchline, everything. Everybody's laughing their asses off. And then because of that, the kid proceeds to tell the joke 20 times over. That's kind of how The Rock was in moments of this movie. He seemed to be a little like, oh, this worked. And the directors are like, do that a lot. And they did it a lot, and maybe they just edited it in too much. Maybe it wasn't The Rock's fault. Maybe it was the director's fault. You know, who knows? The producers could have been like, yeah, roll with that. 
and then and what he was doing was funny but at some point i was like all right man you gotta slow down with the dad jokes and stuff like that it's starting to go overboard and i love a good dad joke nobody likes a good dad joke like me but it is maniac you're gonna like this one man we talked about this recently uh at least we did earlier today but there's a new movie on netflix called the last mercenary with van damme the legendary jean-claude van damme which i think everybody can agree you're either a diehard van damme fan you love the guy like i do like as maniac does i know he does or you just don't care <laughs> or you think he's kind of cheesy or washed up i still love the guy and adore him to death i think he's I'm not saying he's the best of his kind now. Like, you know, obviously I think he hasn't aged quite as well and gotten into his older age quite as well as Stallone or Schwarzenegger have, but he's still awesome. And this movie is actually getting some pretty good buzz. I haven't seen it yet, but people are saying all right things about it, saying that it's actually kind of a comedy and it's a good action movie at the same time. And you get to see Van Damme do some pretty sweet action scenes. I don't think it's based on that, but it's supposed to be pretty flashy within the action scenes and the comedy. Like apparently the comedy is just like, boom, 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 boom. They're just nailing it left and right. <clears throat> so I haven't watched it yet. The, the French dub thing kind of, I don't know, that doesn't bother me. It does. It's not making me not watch it, but it's just when I'm reading the bottom of the screen, I've said this before movies are a visual medium for me. I don't want to have to read when I'm, watching something that i think that you're supposed to be watching the screen for anyways like i recently watched blood red sky and that one was it was all right it was not a bad movie but it they dubbed it instead of reading the subtitles and in this one i feel like when it was half a it was half english language and half foreign language in blood red sky and if you do half and half like that when like the english people are speaking english and the people that are, let's say, from France are speaking French. That makes sense because it's like in Bond films. I like it when you go overseas and Bond starts speaking another language with somebody else and it's subtitled. That I don't mind so much because it's more within dialogue-based moments of the film. And that's kind of how Blood Red Sky was at parts. But also when they were speaking foreign language, I guess my Netflix automatically dubbed it. And just I'm just watching this fake American dubbing or fake English dubbing over the foreign accents. And it took me out of it hardcore. Other than that, I still kind of enjoy the movie. So, like, at least I'm, I'm not going to watch it dubbed. And at least I don't think they're promoting it like that. And I don't know. I'll see. Maybe there's half English in it or not. But I am going to watch it because it's Van Damme. I'm interested in seeing it. And it's getting good reviews. It looks cool. He looks cool. I mean, look at him right here. Looks pretty pretty rugged. He's 60 now, by the way. I don't know if anybody knows that. Or as Maniac, if you know that. Let's see what Asmaniac's talking about. He sent me some more comments up here. He said clown like jokes. Yep. And and you're right. And sorry, he says the trailer gave it. Actually, I'll show you a comment right here saying that trailer gave it a fresh take on JCVD. Yeah. JCVD was good. I don't know if you guys like that movie. If you know that movie, it's a it's kind of hard to explain, actually. It makes it seem like it's a documentary and it's real, but it's not. It's all scripted. But it's a that one again that one was a foreign language a lot of the time but it made sense when they weren't speaking english they were speaking french or whatever other language they were speaking and it, it worked for me because it seemed real i don't want it to be dubbed oh van damme shares a birthday with your mom oh wow that's maniac just said that again that's interesting i don't know how i didn't know that maybe you did tell me that and i just didn't know it if you guys don't have never checked out this guy's channel and probably haven't, but, but there might be a chance that you have check him out. I'll actually put up one of his comments again right here, but look up as maniac on YouTube. He's got some pretty cool videos, a lot of cool different like things where he redoes scenes from movies some things where he'll just kind of make fun of current events that are going on. But to me, it's all hilarious stuff. So you should check out as maniac on YouTube, but moving on here. We get through some more of this stuff. Uh, we got a new shark shark exploitation documentary coming out. I don't know if you guys know the shark exploitation movies I'm talking about, but I'm talking about like Sharknado, 47 Meters Down, The Meg, Deep Blue Sea. 
Now, Jaws and Shallows, those are a little bit more serious, um, but they've made a slew of these things, and they're releasing this thing right here called Shark Exploitation, and it's nothing but this huge documentary on all these shark films that we've seen in the past, and it's going to be literally diving in from everything from the original Roger Corman stuff from back in the 50s, which that guy, believe it or not, was before Jaws, but I mean, his stuff was cheesy. And it's going to cover stuff like Jaws and then Shallows. And I mean, I think it's going to cover everything. But look, I'm not really into the stupid shark exploitation films, but I do like a good shark movie if it's done well. And I'm curious to watch this documentary. And I love a good documentary on anything, especially about filmmaking. But I'm curious to see this documentary because I want to see the guy's perspectives on who are truly making these stupid, stupid, ridiculous shark movies like Sharknado. I'm just curious to see, to jump into their brains a little bit, see some interviews and see why these guys, one, did it in the first place. Because I know that it's turned into this weird thing where it's just like, let's make more and more and more of them with Ian Ziering and Tara Reid. And, and they're supposed to be stupid from the get-go. I'm not so sure that some of the original ones were supposed to be that stupid. I think they were maybe trying. I don't know. That's just a theory of mine. But of course, they've gotten ridiculous. Kind of like, you know, the Saw movies was the first Saw was good. And the rest of them started just becoming torture porn. Kind of that similar thing to me. Just a little theory. But I am looking forward to seeing that thing, shark exploitation. I do think that it'll be fun to watch the history of just because who doesn't love a good monster creature feature and shark movies to me are some of the scariest because I'm deathly afraid of sharks. I don't get in the ocean because of it. That's right. I don't get in the water. Anybody out there want to hate on me? Do it. Do it all day long. But I just, it ain't for me. I'll go to the beach all day. I love the beach. I would even move to the beach. But I'm not getting in that water. I feel like it's their territory. I, if, I mean, I, I just, I'm, I'm like this compared to those guys swimming. I just want to, I don't want nothing to do with it. So because of that, I, I find shark movies fascinating if they're done well. I do like cheesy films, but I don't like cheesy creature features. To me, that I, those are not enjoyable. Those are just stupid. And I like cheesy films that are kind of cheesy one-liners. I like cheesy movies, and I re reference this one a lot, but like Cobra and, you know, some Van Damme films, things like that. Seagal, the 80s, kind of 90s cheese ball stuff. But I don't like the stuff that's over-the-top cheese ball creature feature. It's just too much. Like the Meg, I tried to enjoy that. I just couldn't. I didn't dig it. Moving on, though, oh, I got some big stuff right here. Have you guys seen the House of Gucci trailer? Man, oh, man. Now, this is something that kind of flew past me. Not that the movie flew past me, because it didn't. The movie didn't fly past me at all. But the fact that Ridley Scott's directing it, and he's directing The Last Duel, both coming out this year, which that means he was working on those movies who knows if he was doing them at the same, I'm sure they overlapped somehow, but man, look at these guys in this Al Pacino on the top left, Lady Gaga, obviously in the middle there, Adam driver on the top, right on the bottom, right. You've got Jeremy irons and then on the bottom left, that's Jared Leto. What? All right. Let me get you another picture of, of Jared right here. That's him by himself, just regular, normal Jared Leto on the left. And then that's him on the right. Now, I know makeup can do a lot of stuff. But, I mean, yes, I can kind of see Leto in there a little bit. But for the most part, that's crazy looking how he just. It's funny to me sometimes why they'll choose some of these guys to become somebody that looks totally different. It's like, why don't I just cast somebody that looks like the guy you're trying to get them to look like? But. I think part of the allure is the person transforming themselves and becoming believable and doing a, an acting job that's so good that you're like, oh, shit, that was amazing. And he is a badass actor. He truly is a good actor. I'm not going to deny that at all. I think musically he's a good musician, but 30 Seconds to Mars, in my opinion, has kind of gone downhill. I don't care for their music like I used to. The first couple albums are great. Now they just got a little too poppy for me. But I do like Jared Leto as an actor, and I like parts of his Joker. But... This is Adam and Lady Gaga. And if you guys haven't seen the trailer, man, they do a really good job in it. And Lady Gaga is completely believable. Her accent's believable, everything. And I think the reason now that I started thinking about it more and more is she's Italian. 
she's raised in a, a, an Italian girl. I, I don't even, I can't remember her last name, but I know that she's is an Italian girl. Her name's Stephanie. Uh, I should have looked that up. But the accents are great in this. The directing looks along the lines of like a Goodfellas or a Wolf of Wall Street. I mean, it just looks great. It looks like it's taken over, over tons of different locations. Like right here, this is a picture of them over in the mountains. Then obviously it's taking place over in Italy and it's taking place out in France and just all these different fashion capitals of the world, LA, New York, all that stuff. I love Adam Driver. He's a phenomenal actor. You can't deny that Lady Gaga, she's become pretty badass. I mean, if you saw her in A Star is Born, I mean, she did a great job in that. And she's also done some cool stuff in American Horror Story. Thought she's a good actor. So her accent works in this trailer. If you guys haven't seen the trailer for that, I highly recommend checking that out. It does look really good. Kind of flew off. I knew it was coming out, but it just kind of flew past the radar for me until I saw something on it. But once I saw something on it, I was like, I forgot it was directed by Ridley Scott. And then the trailer looks great. So I'm just pumped up about that, man. Movies are back. It just feels so good, the fact that movies are totally back now. There was a whole year. I know Asmania can attest to this because he, he digs into the world of movies like I do. It was just what, nothing coming out. And then the next thing you know, we're like convincing ourselves that shitty shows are good. <laughs> uh, movies, you know, it wasn't bad. And then, and then we start using the, the, the excuse. Well, you know, for a pandemic movie, it was pretty good. You know, from, you know, during the pandemic and that's the other thing too, everything just gets chalked up. Uh, we pretty good for the pandemic, you know, <laughs> but moving on to something else here, new trailer right here. The new Venom trailer just came out today. And actually, it was just released probably about four hours ago or so. And boy, oh boy, does that look good. Now, here's the deal. When I say good, I'm not meaning like Oscar-worthy good or even in-game good. I'm meaning it's going to be a lot of fun. Because the first one wasn't necessarily good but it was a lot of fun. And we got that teaser of uh, Cletus, Cassidy. Cletus Cassidy. I was trying to think of his name for some reason. I was drawing a blank. It's because I'm live. I'm, I'm doing a live stream and I'm, I'm getting brain farts. But Cletus Cassidy is who Woody Harrelson plays. And he's at the end of part one. And he does that. You know, it's a little cameo scene, but it definitely got everybody pumped up. And we're all like, oh, he's going to be carnage. And even says the word carnage. But that while the trailer does look a lot of fun and it looks just as fun as the first one did. And I'm not expecting this to be like, wow, that movie moved me because some of the Marvel movies that are MCU films will actually move you. I'm not expecting anything like that out of this movie. I'm just expecting to have a good fun and Venom just to F up a bunch of stuff and then carnage getting there too. And, and, and make them for them to make carnage really scary. And I'm hopeful it'll get an R rating. Hopeful. Maybe y'all know that if it is or not yet, but hopefully it'll get an R rating. But it's okay. So look at this. And they, they are also, that's another thing. They're touching on the origin story of Cletus Cassidy in this, which is cool because he is a serial killer in the comics. And if they do that the right way and make him really sinister and evil, that's going to work well. I think that I like that because I just love horror. But I've got a problem with one thing, and I, it definitely involves consistency. So you see Cletus Cassidy right here. Look at him. That's in the part one at the very end. Even though he's only in the movie for a few seconds, that's at the end of part one, and that's what he looks like. Everybody was talking about how terrible his hair looked, and honestly, I mean, it doesn't look awesome, but it doesn't look terrible to me. Well, in this one, they made his hair like almost a sandy blonde, and that's that's cool, but it's it's nothing like this. And look, he's supposed to be in prison here. Unless he dyes his hair a lighter cutter, color and they explain that, which they might. They might do something like that completely right away. They might just show him getting out of prison and dyeing his hair and cutting it. So, okay, that works. But even then, it shows him in prison with hair this color in the trailer. So, I'm not sure. That just Stuff like that bugs me. I don't know if you guys remember in Spider-Man 3. They did the same thing with MJ. MJ had this, like, I mean, literally Auburn fire engine red hair in part one. It got a little lighter in part two. But by the time they got to part three, it was like a sandy blonde. And to me, I just don't understand that. And it wasn't like they were trying to say she had died or it looked die. I don't know. 
to me, maybe that's a stupid nitpick, but that stuff just bothers me for some reason. I like to feel like it's, it's truly connected. You know, I don't, I love it when like, this is going to be a terrible example, but to all you fanboys out there that are horror fans out there, you'll know what I'm talking about, especially if you're a Friday the 13th fan, which by the way, this Friday is Friday the 13th or next Friday is Friday the 13th. Shit, not this Friday, next Friday. But uh, at the end of part four, or excuse me, the entire part four of Friday the 13th, it's called the final chapter, <laughs> part four, the final chapter. That movie has Corey Feldman the whole way through and spoiler alert, if you hadn't seen it, but Corey kills Jason at the end of that movie. Awesome scene. Part four is a fan favorite. It's most everybody's favorite. It's my favorite of the films as far as that has Jason as the killer, you know. And Corey Feldman was in certain ways supposed to be in the next film in part three. And he was supposed to sort of be the lead character again, but a little bit more grown up, take the torch some more. And because of doing things like Gremlins and being busy with just Spielberg and doing all these other movies, because he became huge at that point as a child actor, he wasn't able to do it. However, they were able to write his character into the beginning of the film. So when you see the beginning of the movie, Corey Feldman is almost just as old as he was in part two, or excuse me, in part four. So at the beginning of part five, he was just as old as he was in part four. And he's, it starts out with him and it just has this huge connective tissue that works really well. And right way, right away with this picture of Cletus Cassidy from the original movie, comparing it to the new movie, Venom, Let There Be Carnage, or Venom 2 is what I'm calling it because it's just too much of a mouthful the other way. I just, it's, it's, it's inconsistencies and there's not that connective tissue that makes me love like, oh, here's part two. It feels like, oh, here's just another Venom movie. I don't know. If that bothers people. It just bothers me. But the trailer does look pretty fun. I'm excited about it. The movie is just going to be a bash to the finish between these two right here, which is going to be great. I mean, they're marketing like crazy with Venom gotten, you know, the red tentacles wrapped around him, which is carnage. I'm going to have a lot of fun with this movie. I'll probably go see it at, at the Thursday night, midnight or whatever. Or even if it's earlier than that, I'll probably go see that. I will see it on the big screen. I do own Venom. I don't think it's an amazing movie, but I do think it's like a party comic book film, if that makes any sense. So I'm excited. You guys excited? Who's going to go see it in the theater? Anyone? Any, any six of you out there? <laughs> okay. With talking about Venom and Marvel, even though that's not MCU film yet, or it's not Venom's not in the MCU yet, I have a feeling that at some point it's going to cross over. Let's merge on to the main topic of the day. And that is of Scarlett Johansson and the Disney war that is brewing right now. Actually, it's not brewing. It started. Any of you guys that don't know, Scarlett Johansson is suing Disney because they released Black Widow on Disney Plus Premiere. And if you don't know what Disney Plus Premiere is, that's their way of charging for a theatrical release through their Disney Plus streaming service. So... You can't just order the Disney movie by itself. They may have made it a way to do that from my understanding, though. You have to have Disney Plus and you have to purchase the movie through Disney Plus. Pay an extra 30 bucks. My mom and my stepdad did that with Cruella. And that was cool, you know. But at the end of the day, they have to know that this is just costing them. I mean, they know that it's costing them money. Disney's too big of a company to, and they have too many financial analysts to know this isn't a good route. We are going to lose money. We can't make that theater money through streaming services. And even if you charge 30 bucks for one movie, I know that even my friends and I were talking about, let's just all come over here and like Suicide Squad. I'm not trying to. This isn't stealing because I pay for the service. This is the way that they're allowing us to do it. And it's a stupid move. But I mean, my friends are coming over to watch Suicide Squad on Thursday night. And it's through HBO Max. And there's no rule or law saying that you can't have somebody over at your house to watch a movie with you. And that's just stupid on Disney's part. It was stupid on Warner Brothers' part to do it with HBO Max. And it's stupid on Disney to do that with these blockbuster movies. And 
they they really can't even gauge how these movies are doing through Disney Plus through that premier access because all it gauges is households doesn't gain individual it doesn't gauge individual tracking so not to make this like a, a technical lesson about the how the way entertainment works but if you've got black widow going to the theater and it was not released at all on Disney streaming plus cuz i know a lot of people you the numbers are there the numbers came out of how much it actually made on Disney as far as how many people saw it, how many people paid for it, all that stuff. I mean, and it was pretty good, but like you said, you're talking about probably five to six, seven people in a household that are watching this movie on premiere. That's why they charge 30 bucks. But if you're, if I'm going to the movie theater, I'm paying eight to nine bucks minimum. And that's, if, and that's if I go before noon, if I, or maybe it's before five, if I go to a matinee, but at nighttime it's 13 to 15 bucks automatically. And these big blockbusters, that's how they make their money. They did it with Cruella. They did it with this. They did it with Jungle Cruise, which is I'm maybe The Rock has like some other sort of contract with them and his he's fine with it. But I do know that Scarlett, she had her money invested in this movie. She was an executive producer. She put part of her money into the film. Therefore, part of her contract showed that she would get profits based on the income of the ticket sales and she's not the first one to do this. Robert Downey Jr. Did it. And he renegotiated a lot of other people's contracts to help them make more money because they were all getting paid next to nothing compared to him. That's a whole other story, but her contract says that they will release it in theaters and she will make money off of those tickets. That didn't happen. I mean, yeah, she made money off the tickets that were sold, but the tickets, weren't that high to begin with. And it went down drastically within the first week so much as to where she's suing. And so is uh, the rumor is now that Emma Stone is suing. And the other big thing is this old, is our boy, Kevin Feige. Apparently he's not happy. Apparently he's not happy at all with Disney. Apparently he's mad and he gives them their full blessing saying, yeah, I'm behind you guys. This is stupid. They said one thing and then they're trying to turn it around on you. And this is, this is what is really, really bad. And this is what's pretty embarrassing. Disney comes back saying there's no merit whatsoever. And it's especially sad and distressing in this callous disregard for the horrific and prolonged global effects of COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, that already, I didn't, as soon as I heard that, I said to myself, that is a guilt cop-out, a straight guilt cop-out. And they're being called out about it. Everybody's being like, you guys, I can't believe you just said that. In fact, Scarlett Johansson, her agent came out and said this, slamming Disney, accusing the Black Rudo star for disregarding the public COVID risk. They're trying to turn her into somebody that she's not is what they're saying the Hollywood Reporter even said it. They're just like, Disney is trying to make Joe Hansen look like somebody she's not because she's asking for the money that she was owed. And Disney is trying to blame it on COVID. Now, look, of course, the pandemic happened and it's still happening. Nobody's, I'm not trying to say it didn't. I don't think Scarlett Johansson's trying to say it didn't. However, Disney has already mentioned that they lost money because of their premiere releases. They've, they've already owned up to that a little bit, saying it maybe was a mistake, but they've already committed to these just like HBO Max has, so they're doing it. Yeah, you lost some money from a lot of money from your parks because you can't open the parks and things like that. And that, if anybody doesn't know, the parks is a huge revenue source for Disney. They don't just make their money off their movies. I mean, yeah, it's merchandise and things like that, but a lot of their revenue sources revenue sources from their parks. I mean, if you've ever been, you know how much it costs just to go for a day. So yeah, they're in a situation where they can't make as much money as they were before the pandemic. However, they, they would have made more money if they would have just released it in theaters. I do think that they, I do think certain families that watched it on premiere plus would have been like, you know what, let's go to the theater and see this It's black widow. It's a Marvel movie. I think it would have happened, but instead they released it on Premiere Plus, and that's just 
That's a huge, huge strike down in, in sales. And I, I do believe their contract even says something like once it reaches a certain point in the sales of ticket sales, then that's when her back end starts coming in and the profits start coming in for her. So I, I don't even think it ever reached that point. I could be wrong about that, but most of the time when these guys sign these contracts, they don't just start making money as soon as the first tickets start making money. It's, it's something about the studio getting to their point to where they've made theirs back. And then after that, Scarlett Johansson starts making a, a portion of the profits. And a lot of actors do that. And a lot of actors do make portions from the profits in the beginning, but that's usually because they're involved with their own production companies that are involved with the film itself. And I mean, it goes deeper than just them being in the film and putting a little money into it or signing a contract. But her contract did sign that she would get the, this much money after a certain point, And she was a producer on the film. So like with the rumor of Emma Stone following suit and doing the same thing, following suit, literally, like I said, Kevin Feige is not happy with this and he's supporting them. He's behind them. And you don't want to mess with Kevin Feige in the Marvel world or the Disney world or in the movie world. I would say at this point, and look, Kevin Feige hasn't even, it hasn't been just since the MCU started that Kevin Feige has been involved. Kevin Feige has been involved since the first X-Men movie. He's been involved since comic book films really started getting into the, like Marvel movies, started really starting to make their stride because X-Men kind of started it. Spider-Man, X-Men was the fuse. Spider-Man was the bomb that went off for comic books that made it just like, all right, now we want to start making them. And then the MCU was pretty much the world destruction takeover of the bomb. You know what I'm saying? Like that, the, the MCU was the army full of bombs. It finally just said, everybody wants to make comic book movies, but you first had X-Men opened a window. Then Spider-Man really opened that window. And now it's, it's fully open. Kevin Feige was a part of all of that. Kevin Feige was a producer on the X-Men films and the Spider-Man films. He was always consulting, always doing stuff. And I even feel like on the amazing Spider-Man films, he went back and helped him out with some things here and there because he was also trying to get the amazing Spider-Man into the MCU, the Andrew Garfield version. A lot of people don't realize that he was trying to play ball with Spider-Man a long time ago. And I don't think it was because he just loved Andrew Garfield. I just think that he wanted Spider-Man to be involved. He wanted that to help the MCU launch. He knew that it was something that needed to be done. In the long run, I'm glad we got the Tom Holland version for sure. I think it's just better. It works better. It or it had more of an organic origination in the MCU rather than it being shoehorned in from another franchise, which I'm just happy that it happened that way. But Kevin Feige is grown literally the biggest film franchise that's ever existed in film history. And look, Bond is about to be on its 25th film. We've already gotten 24 films from Marvel and we're about to get 27 by the end of the year on top of the Disney plus stuff. Now they've already surpassed in 13, 14, 15 years, already surpassed what James Bond has done since 1960 to now. I mean, we're approaching, we're, what is that, 70 years? No, that's terrible math, right? 40, 50, 60, 60 something years. Yeah. So that's 60, 61 years that same, that Marvel surpassed the same thing that Bond did in 61 years. Marvel's done that in 15. So, what I'm trying to make that Kevin Feige is unstoppable and he is somebody that's going to keep going and he has a creative vision, a huge, massive long-term vision that it's obviously been working and you do have some hit or misses here and there there here and there everybody's always got a bad day at the office i've always said that you can't expect everybody to be perfect all the time but anytime marvel has a little bit of slump or here or there does something that doesn't work they they retaliate quickly and bounce back and if not to where they were even better so i'm always confident in kevin feige and what they're going to do and the fact that he's pissed at disney right now it's not a good thing. And it's all because of this guy, from what I understand. Now, if y'all don't know who this guy is, this guy's name is Bob Chapek. This is the new CEO of Disney. Now, it used to be this guy. Not him. This guy, Bob Iger. 
Bob Iger was making everyone super happy. He was, he got involved with Disney and he simplified everything when he got involved with Disney as their CEO. And he had been working with Disney for a long time, but as their CEO, he straight up said, Kevin Feige, you can do what you want. You can come in here and you can literally just keep doing everything you're doing. We're just here to give you money. Cause look, let me break this down. And this is not trying to be another history lesson or anything like that, but I don't know if if anybody's aware or if everybody's aware of what Disney owns, Disney is huge as far as the control that they have. Now, if you look into this picture, they own all this. This is all under the umbrella of Disney. But just because Disney owns Marvel doesn't mean that they go to Marvel and say, we want you to do this, do this, do this, do this. Marvel is their own studio, and it was their own studio before Disney bought it. Same thing with ESPN. ESPN was its own sports network before Disney bought the reins to it. ABC Studios. Disney just owns that company, and let's say they're in a little bit of a bind. Disney can get them out of a bind, or Disney can launch their properties through that as a conduit. Lucasfilm. Lucasfilm uses Disney as, hey, we're going to do everything Star Wars and everything, I think, Indiana Jones at this point. They may have that because of Fox, 20th Century, all that stuff. So, anyways, or excuse me, no, Indiana Jones is paramount, isn't it? I'm getting off topic. Let me let me just erase the Indiana Jones deal. Star Wars, though, we do know that Disney owns Star Wars. They bought that a while back. Pixar, same thing. They're a studio. They did do this one thing with, the Cars movies where that was sort of like Disney being like, we need you to make these three films, but that was a deal they made. That's a deal they worked out and they were made these because the Cars films are not the best Pixar movies. In my opinion, they're the, the worst three in my opinion, but they're also the most childish. They're the least adult. I think adults can have the least amount of fun in those movies. My buddy and I as maniac, were talking about that the other day. How, what is it about these movies that just doesn't work like the other Pixar films? And it's because they were like, yeah, we need you to put these out and be the half sort of like the Pixar kid movies. And they sold a lot. I mean, the merchandising was like crazy on that. All little kids love the Cars trilogy and they just go crazy. Over. They love Mater. But point I'm trying to make is, is that Disney only owns these companies because they want to make the money that these companies are generating. Marvel was generating a lot of money. And then so Disney bought them. Lucasfilm, that was a huge deal to own Star Wars. So they bought that. ESPN bought it. They own Hulu. They just bought Fox, but they just turned 20th Century Fox into 20th Century Studios. Bob Iger, this guy, has never, ever meddled with the artists. He lets Kevin Feige look. He's like, Kevin Feige, you're the comic book geek. You're the guy that knows these characters. You're the guys that know how to do these things. I want you to go make your movies. We'll approve them and make sure that there's not doing these, breaking these Disney rules and all that stuff. And we're not offending this stuff and going too dark and whatever. But we want you to do your thing, man, because you're the one that knows what's up with it. So did the same thing with Star Wars. And, and Star Wars is messed up on certain areas as well because Kathleen Kennedy's done some messed up things, in my opinion. But it got back on the boat with Mandalorian. And that was Bob Iger letting John Favreau and all those guys just do their thing. You guys make it work, roll with it. And it was working awesome. Everybody loved the working relationship with them in Hollywood. This guy, not so much, man. He's getting some bad press right now. He's not even been in there for a year. Now, look, I'm not there in person. I don't know what happens. I'm truly not there. But when you're getting Kevin Feige mad, who's known to be a company man, who's known to be somebody who loves his actors, has a great relationship with his actors, they all do anything for him, remains in good contact with all his actors. When you have him mad at the new CEO, and mind you, Kevin Feige was getting along beautifully with Bob Iger, something's up. I mean, Bob Iger and Chapek are parting ways because Chapek is the new guy. Bob Iger's on his way out. He's not going to be involved as a CEO in Disney anymore. I think he's going to have money in it and maybe some sort of like maybe chairman type stuff like that. 
But I honestly wouldn't be surprised if a board somehow or another got Chapek out of there because we haven't even begun to see the wrath of Chapek. And I'm not talking down on this guy as a human being, but what I feel is happening is, is he's meddling with these people and controlling things without consulting the family. Cause yeah, Marvel is its own studio. It's owned by Disney and all that, but you are still part of the same umbrella and like it or not, what you do to over here is going to affect somebody over here. So him just automatically ignoring Scarlett Johansson's contract, breaching that, and doing the same thing with Emma Stone, and then calling her out and making and making her look like a bad guy and saying you're being callous because of the pandemic. You're not thinking about the pandemic. That has nothing to do with it. You're just trying to make up for your bad decisions, and you're gotten you're getting people trying to say this stuff. I mean, that's a terrible comeback from Disney. Terrible comeback from them. So Disney's in trouble. Feige's not happy. Scarlett's not happy. I'm hoping this guy gets out of here personally. I don't know why. When even people tell, told me this guy, Bob Chapek, something about that name I didn't like. And look at him. Doesn't he look like Hank from Breaking Bad? Looks just like Hank. And Hank was cool, but Hank was also too much of a hard ass. This guy, this looks more like who you want. This looks like a guy who understands the way Disney works. And yeah, I'm just talking about these guys and the way they look. But I do believe that, I don't know, if Chapek keeps on up to what he's doing, because like I said, we haven't begun to see the damage he's going to do because the projects that he's truly greenlit or um, what's the word, crippled, if you want to say, who knows what he's done to some projects yet? Who knows who he's gotten in there with to... Being like, no, nope, change that up because we want to do this and we need to do more of this and more of this. Or who knows who knows what other projects that he's breaching contracts on. Now, I'm not sitting here saying that the guy is just a contract breacher, but he's done it with two different people now. And they were both, I don't know, huge, huge money makers for you as far as the names. I mean, Cruella, I think, has sort of revived the Dalmatian property a little bit. I know I loved that movie. I liked it better than Black Widow, actually. But Black Widow, I still liked, and I like it even more now that I've seen it a second time. But you did it to two of your hot people right now. And Scarlett Johansson's done a lot more for Disney than just that. She was in the Jungle Book. And I, I feel like that Jojo Rabbit was a an inadvertent Disney movie. Maybe it was done by 20th Century or Touchstone. I don't even think Touchstone exists anymore. But it was one of their independent branches, I believe. But we're talking about an Oscar-nominated actress here. We're not talking about somebody that, oh, she won't be. I mean, Scarlett Johansson's been around since she's a kid, and she's stuck around, and she's going to be around. And she helped you with – she's a core Avenger. She helped you sell the franchise. She was an Avenger before Steve Rogers got in there as far as in the what we saw on screen. I mean, she was an Iron Man too. So I just think that this is a bad move with Disney. <laughs> <laughs> excuse me what do you guys think you think disney's just in trouble because of bob chapek do you think that this is something that can be fixed do you think that kevin feige's maybe getting fed up you think kevin feige might try to overthrow him with some other people and the board try to vote that dude out i don't know i'd like to get bob Iger back personally but i know he's done i know his heart's not in it anymore and, you know, I don't know what it takes to run Disney. It's probably a pain in the ass. <laughs> See, we got one more comment up here. Oh, hey, you're back. What's up, buddy? The Disney machine. Yep. I don't really have a whole lot more to say about the Disney machine. It's just I wanted to see what you guys thought about that. And just to talk a little bit about that thing. Oh, yeah, I don't trust Kathleen, Kathleen Kennedy at all. As Manic says, he doesn't trust her. I don't trust her at all, man. She's messed up the Star Wars franchise. And remember, I don't think that she had anything to do with Mandalorian. I think that was all Favreau and Dave Filoni. She didn't really have a whole lot to do with that. But as far as The Last Jedi, Force Awakens, and Rise of Skywalker, she had a lot to do with those. I'm one of those that likes Last Jedi. Don't hate me, but I am one of those that likes it. But I hated Rise. I like enjoy, I enjoy it because it's Star Wars, but I hated Rise of Skywalker. It's just a terrible story. 
I love you, B-Dub, out there. You know who I'm talking to because you're a Star Wars nerd and you love everything Star Wars no matter what. I love you. I ain't trying to hate on your shit, but Rise sucked. <laughs> well, guys, I don't think I have anything else for you today. That's going to be it. That's, uh, that's it. Thanks for tuning in and talking about that. You think Marvel's in trouble because of Disney and Bob Chapek? Do you think that they'll get this shit situated? You guys excited to see the new Venom trailer? I definitely am. The movie's going to be awesome. You guys excited to see House of Gucci? That's going to be great, too. Directed by Ridley Scott. So thank you all for joining me again, guys. Much love. And remember, look for me on Facebook. Look for Bobby Williams on Facebook. You can look for Brassville Brothers on Facebook. Definitely uh, check out my reviews. I've got reviews coming out every weekend. This weekend is definitely going to be the Suicide Squad review. So you guys definitely check that one out. It is going to be the bomb. I'm really excited about it just because James Gunn is awesome. Everything he does is great. So with that being said, guys, love with all of my heart. Peace. Live long and prosper. Uh, if you find a taco on the road, don't eat it. All right. Love you guys. Adios. Adios.